Thank you very much. I thank the English department very much for um, inviting me to come here and uh, uh, talk about Irwin and uh, his legacy here. And I thank all of you for coming to join us to celebrate the life and le legacy of Erwin Steinberg, uh, along with Erwin's um, family. So Erwin's um, son, Alan, and uh, daughter-in-law. Patty, would you stand up and um, <laughs> uh, welcome Erwin's Irwin, son. No, no, no. Thank you. And, and a heads up to you all, at some point or another, everybody in the room will be standing up. <laughs> But Irwin was, as you've heard, um, a literary scholar, uh, an expert in James Joyce and other 20th century uh, writers. And I am so glad that uh, we talked about uh, that because that's not my expertise at all. Uh, Irwin was also a visionary administrator uh, in many positions here at Carnegie Mellon, and I thank you very much for talking about that, because again, that's not at all my expertise. Um, Erwin was also a, um, a scholar, a practitioner, a teacher of plain language and technical writing, and that is uh, my expertise. Much of it learned from Erwin, and that is what I'm going to be spending about uh, the next hour, um, I hope interactively with you, talking about Erwin's uh, life. Um, as uh, David said, um, 60 some odd years. Uh, this is Irwin, if you will, pro of professional life from um, starting in 1946, just after the war as a teacher here uh, until, well, yes, he retired, but did he really retire um, until his passing last, last year? Now, I came into um, this story in the late 1970s, and so I want to start there and then after talking a little bit about how um, I got together with um, Irwin and CMU and Karen gave you a little bit about this, how AIR and Carnegie Mellon got together over the document design project, I'll go back in Irwin's life to the period before I was uh, involved in plain language and technical writing. And then we'll come back to the 1980s and bring the story up to date. So, I um, got involved, as, as Karen explained, I'm a, a linguist by, by training. Um, I did a very esoteric graduate degree. Um, I didn't end up with an academic job because in those days it was very difficult to get to when I married a graduate student who got an um, academic job. And so I was in the Washington, D.C. area and uh, ended up at this uh, not-for-profit think tank uh, world that American Institutes for Research, AIR, uh, and I actually had been for several years before that at a few other similar organizations doing work on um, policy related primarily to bilingualism, to um, how do we teach um, students and adults whose native language is not standard English. But I really wasn't a plain English um, specialist, and I don't think I'd really heard about technical writing, even though I'd probably been doing a lot of it. But I was at AIR. In 1977, the Commission on Federal Paperwork came out with a series of reports, and one of the major recommendations in that series of reports was, as you can see, language should be simplified. Require simple language. Well, there was at that time in the Department of Education, in the research branch of the Department of Education, a group of people, PhDs, um, actually some of them were linguists, uh, some of them were reading specialists, and they began to think about the issue of why do so many people have trouble with government documents? And why are government writers so bad at writing government documents. Why can't we have decent documents? Somebody should go out and study this problem. And so they put out a request for proposal for what they named the Document Design Project. And their request for proposal said that this project would have three major themes. One was research. Go collect all the research from as many different disciplines as you can find that would speak to the problem of poor writing. 
And where you find there is no research, go do some. Do technical assistance. That is, if any government agency wants to try to do plain language, help them so that we create model documents for the future. And the third component was create new academic curricula and programs on the undergraduate and the graduate level so that in the future we have better writers. Well, um, it was a wonderful idea. And this was also the same time, much earlier than many of the people in this room, that Jimmy Carter became president of the United States. And Jimmy Carter believed in public participation in government. He believed in plain language. He thought that everybody should be able to understand everything the government produced and understand well enough to participate in government processes. And so he, in fact, in the middle of the RFP for the Document Design Project came out in January of 1978 with a due date in May of 1978. It was actually quite a long time to be writing a proposal. One of the interesting things about it was it actually required two work samples, rewrite a lease, and do a better job of an airplane safety that booklet that comes in the... So for a while, every time we, we traveled, um, somebody would um, illegally bring home the <laughs> thing from the back of the airline uh, pocket uh, so that we could um, redo these these examples. Well, right in the middle of that period, um, President Carter came out with an executive order that said all government regulations from now on must be written in simple, plain English. So very much fitting in with this. Well, as I say, I was at, uh, as Karen explained, I was at AIR at the time, um, as I say, doing policy issues related to language issues, my uh, a linguist, but uh, I was a very strange person at AIR because AIR is primarily a psychology firm. Um, it was founded by, and I'll show you a picture in a moment, John Flanagan, who had been the head of psychology in the Army Air Force in the Second World War and one of the founders of the field of human factors. So um, AIR full of cognitive psychologists, measurement psychologists, and instructional systems designers. Well, the AIR board thought that this was absolutely, we had to go after this um, document design project because it fits so well into AIR's mission. And it was also clear from a number of things that were happening and related to the request for proposal that the main organization in this, um, for this proposal, for this project, had to be in Washington, D.C. to be near the government agencies you'd be doing technical assistance with. And because there were so many linguists on the panel, um, that they would look favorably at a linguist as the head of the project. But we at AIR knew we didn't know much about technical writing. And also, we needed a university collaborator to do the work on new curricula. So we turned to Carnegie Mellon. And there were many reasons for this, and I'll elaborate that in a little bit. And then when we were together, Irwin and um, Lee Gregg, whom I will come to again in a moment, and we at AIR um, got together to plan this proposal, we realized that we actually didn't have the practical experience in designing new plain language material that some of the people who would compete with us for this project would have. And so we went and had uh, asked to join our collaboration um, a very prominent New York design firm, Siegel and & Gale. And as a collaboration, we turned in the proposal for the document design project on time, um, actually with about three minutes to spare, because <laughs> I'm the one who drove like crazy down, down to the place where they had to go in to the document design for the document design project. And the reason I'm spending so much time on this particular project is because it really was the heart of beginning a lot of things, both at CMU and at AIR. But why CMU? Well, many, many reasons. <coughs> the first is actually AIR is a Pittsburgh firm. It actually, John Flanagan was at Carnegie Tech and he started AIR in Pittsburgh. 
1978, there still was a, uh, an office in Pittsburgh, someplace very close to campus here. Um, although um, between its founding in 1946 and the time that I'm talking about in the late 70s, uh, John had decided that the headquarters for AIR had to be in Washington, D.C. because it um, needed to be near its primary funding sources. But John didn't want to live anymore either in Pittsburgh or in Washington since they both had winter, and he took himself to Palo Alto and somehow got the uh, powers that be in Palo Alto to allow him to build three magnificent Japanese-style buildings on the top of a hill in a residential area of Palo Alto. But again, AIR had very strong Carnegie and Pittsburgh connections. Secondly, Irwin was here. And there was already technical writing here. There was already plain language. And third, there really was a willingness here to work on those new curricula and start new graduate programs. And I'll come back to this and to Dick, who is um, here. Um, also, um, CMU was known for its interdisciplinary programs and for being willing to collaborate across um, departments. So Irwin in English and Lee Gregg, had, then head of psychology, were quite willing to do this together. And of course, there was research going on here. Dick Hayes and Linda Flower, who are both here. Dick, Santa, Linda, Linda, I know you're, the, I know you're here. Linda, <laughs> um, we're already doing the most relevant research that I could think of on writing, actually thinking about the cognitive understanding of how writers work and how readers work. And I want to emphasize that because it was so important to us at AIR, being a research-based firm, to me, even though this was not my original field, to have come out of a research theory-based world, um, what was the measure of plain language for many people at the time was a readability formula. That is, you know, you count the shortness of the sentences, you count the shortness of the words, and you get a number, and if the number is good, you're happy. And to us, that wasn't what it was about at all. And I knew that to our funders, that wasn't what it was about at all. They named it the Document Design Project. They meant design in the large. And that is the whole notion that what we're trying to do is create a successful communication. We're not worried about a readability formula or a number. We're worried about what is the research and theory behind doing better. And so, yeah, that was fabulous. And uh, there was Lee Gregg um, in psychology. And Erwin and Lee Gregg put together a symposium on research and writing that resulted in this 1980 book, Cognitive Processes in Writing. And I'm going to show a picture of Linda and Dick's work from that book a little later in our time together. Unfortunately, Lee Gregg passed away um, quite, uh, I assume, quite young, but in that time period in the early 1980s in the early 1980s. And we got the project. And we started to work together. And uh, I know you probably can't read that. I'm going to, but this is the program from a symposium that Irwin organized in 1980. Linda Smiley, you remember? I remember the symposium. But thanks to Karen Shriver, Karen, <laughs> who helped me a lot with this, with this um, talk. She had it in her archives. This is so fabulous. Because here are um, Dick uh, Hayes and Linda Flower talking about their research. Uh, here am I with a fellow um, colleague, from the, with a colleague from the Document Design Project in, from AIR, Vita Charo, uh, who, like my, uh, who is also a linguist. Uh, here is Andy Rose, another one of our uh, AIR team, a cognitive psychologist. Here is Melissa Holland, another one of our AIR team, also a linguist. Here is Irwin chairing the session on legal communication. So there was a session on basic research, that's where Linda, uh, Dick and Linda's uh, paper was, on applied research, that was where most of the AIR folks were, um, on um, uh, design uh, communication, which were actually some colleagues of Alan Siegel's, legal communication, because one of the major things was legal documents into plain language. Um, and here was our third party, Alan Siegel. Um, so that's uh, 
showing you how we really collaborated on the document design project. And for me, um, again, I, I was project director of this great collaboration with a background that had really nothing to do with plain language and technical writing. And I learned most of it on the job from Irwin and Vic and Linda and other people who had been working in the field. Well, I want to take us back now, um, giving you where I came in, and take you back in Irwin's life that I actually have learned most of about in the last few weeks. And then I'll come back forward and talk some more about the document design project and the centers which came out of that and then bring us up to date. So Irwin um, was teaching uh, in the 1950s, uh, again, long before your, your time. Uh, Carnegie was several different schools. There was Carnegie Tech, the engineering, and there was the Margaret Morrison Carnegie College for Women. And in 1958, Irwin started, he got the college to agree to, I mean, there was already an English department. And in fact, I find it fascinating that um, the engineering students in Carnegie Tech had to take three classes in English at this time, but they couldn't major in English because English was part of the Margaret Morrison Carnegie College for Women. So only women could major in English at the time. Irwin started a degree, a bachelor's degree, in technical writing and editing in 1958. And this was such an interesting and new idea that it made the press from the Pittsburgh Press in October of 1958 and noticed that it was on the women's pages. <laughs> and noticed that it was about writer for outer space, which was, of course, Sputnik and all of that. Well, I have all of this thanks to Janice Ramey, who in fact was in that class and who is here. So Janice, stand up and, <laughs> and here is that picture, Irwin, 1958, and Janice, um, the start of a fabulous program and a terrific and successful career that Janice has had and also being very active in the local chapter, the Pittsburgh chapter of the Society for Technical Communication. And this may, in fact, have been the first undergraduate degree major in technical writing. The Carnegie Mellon website claims that it is. Uh, I find it interesting that uh, in 2011, uh, and it, someone whose name escapes me at the moment, um, Simmons? No, no, um, who wrote the article in Technical Communication. There was an article in Technical Communication, which is the Journal of the Society for Technical Communication, in 2011 about the history, the early history of technical communication. And it, it, it mentions Irwin, has a copy, in fact, of this picture, of this picture um, in, the, in the article, but also says that two years earlier, in 1956, Simmons College in Boston started a major in technical um, writing and um, publishing. Now, was that two years earlier a first degree? I'm not sure, because apparently the Simmons College um, major was really an interdisciplinary. You had to major in technical uh, journalism and a technical subject. So I'm not sure. But I find it, also find it fascinating that these early degrees were in women's colleges. I mean, I'm a graduate of Bryn Mawr, um, which is still a all-women's college. So I come out of the same era of um, single-sex um, colleges, uh, much of which has disappeared today. But I, I do find it very interesting, because all the technical writers out there in the workforce, are men, most of them at the time, right, were male. They were engineers who either liked to or had been forced to become writers of engineering reports. So, um, Irwin, 1958. And um, Irwin brought to that, <coughs> excuse me, Irwin brought 
to that major, not only his expertise as a teacher of writing, of style, of grammar, but also his experience out in the work world because he had been consulting with those mostly male engineers, um, teaching them how to write better at uh, places uh, around Pittsburgh, Jones and Laughlin Steel, Westinghouse, Alcoa. Um, he was still doing that, actually, at the time of the uh, back where we started this story in the 1970s because he involved me in some of the, um, as Chris had said, uh, her, for herself, uh, some of this consulting, uh, consulting work. Well, in addition to bringing in the consulting and in addition to starting this um, undergraduate major, um, he had a situation where he had a course and no textbook. So he wrote the textbook. And uh, this is 1960, uh, Communication in Business and Industry. And I love this picture that Janice um, Ramey uh, did for me of the modern computer and the, uh, what, 50-year-old book um, because the book is as valuable today as it was then. We can look at this, for example, these are the titles of the first six chapters of communication in business and industry. Um, and they are, in fact, well, just what you folks are, I assume, teaching today. It's what I go out and do workshops and teach people. The first thing we have to do is understand the context of use, so the climate of business. Um, we because we are based in rhetoric and cognitive psychology, we know that it's all about understanding the audience. So considering the audience is the second one. Um, plain language isn't necessarily about short sentences and short words. It's not about prescriptions, but it definitely is about writing concisely and not wasting your prose. No wasteful prose. It's about writing in a way that your reader is going to understand because understanding that your reader is an active participant in any act of communication. So no jargon. Define jargon as your internal language that your outsiders don't understand. That plain language is about writing within the context of the situation and the day that an awful lot of what we deal with when we deal with um, a particularly government writing, legal writing, that isn't plain is because it's a usage that's hundreds of years old and isn't the way we do things today. And getting down to very specific guidelines, chapter, what are we up to now? Chapter six, um, one of the hallmarks of plain language is taking responsibility and writing with the active voice and in that same chapter, um, Irwin um, talked about what he called diluted verbs, what uh, out of linguistics we call nominalizations, which is a horrible nominalization, um, <laughs> right? As in, you don't take a good verb or a good adjective and turn it into a noun. So here we are with the same plain language we are teaching today. In fact, um, here from another place, in the 1960s book. How many of us today are writing lists like this for clients and colleagues, right, to put into style guides? It's the same, isn't it? Um, and I love this out of the book. Um, the writing process, um, determine real purpose, gather, select, order, check against purpose, write, recheck against purpose. <laughs> Um, last night, I uh, spoke to the local chapter of the Society of Technical Communication in a talk I call Purposes, Personas, Conversations, because I am still find that the greatest need of the people who invite me to give workshops, and these are primarily for people in business, in government, who are subject matter specialists, scientists, other way, who are not trained plain language writers, the problem is they don't plan. They don't think about the fact that all writing in the workplace is meant to achieve something. And that the first question you have to ask is, what am I trying to achieve through this writing? Real purpose. Irwin knew about it in 1960. So let me now come back and talk about what happened uh, further 
in the document design project. And as I said, the um, three parts of the uh, document design project, research, technical assistance, new academic curricula, well, we shared and did a lot of the research together, and I'll come back to that in, in a moment. Um, AIR did most of the technical assistance because we were there in Washington, D.C., but CMU certainly had the lead in academic curricula. And in fact, by the time the document design project started in the very late 1970s, um, Carnegie Tech, uh, the Margaret Morrison College, had all merged into Carnegie uh, and then Carnegie Mellon. And what had been apparently a division of humanities and social sciences became the College of Humanities and Social Sciences. And the English department absorbed um, the technical writing in 1978, creating, in fact, a new bachelor's degree in professional um, writing, right? Um, just out of curiosity, anybody in the room hold a bachelor's in professional writing from Carnegie Mellon University? Stand up, stand up, stand up. <laughs> Come on, stand up, <laughs> stand up. You, people are going to stand, people are going to stand for us. <laughs> oh, that's okay. That's okay. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. Uh, you count. You count. You will, in a few weeks, be graduates of the, right? And, um, but the primary things that, so that existed before the document design project came. But in the document design project days, what happened was Richard Young came to chair the department. Richard? <laughs> Uh, everybody, Richard Young, and, and Richard really believed in what, I mean, Irwin was here, right, and, but Richard really believed in what um, we were talking about and doing, and out of that came the three graduate programs, the Masters of Arts in Professional Writing, the Master of Arts in Rhetoric, and the PhD in Rhetoric. So, um, how many people in the room hold a Masters of Art in Professional Writing? You get to... Stand up. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, and, and some people may stand up several times. So uh, how about Master of Arts in Rhetoric? Okay. And how about PhD in Rhetoric? Okay. Okay. So all of you, all of you are in some way Irwin's legacy. And Dick Young's legacy and uh, um, from all the other professors whom you have here. Um, and in fact, uh, here is the current uh, crop. So any of you here uh, from that it's picture? Old. It's an old photo. Oh, OK. So these people are uh, stood up. You are, OK. So website, we need a new picture of that. <laughs> but uh, in addition, uh, you need faculty, not just students. So uh, Dick Young. Uh, brought Linda over, you were in business originally, and brought Linda Flower into the English department, and brought Dave Kaufer uh, here, and uh, Richard Enos, uh, who has now gone to Texas, to Texas Tech in, in Lubbock. Um, but, um, and over the years, of course, uh, more, more faculty um, in, uh, in the English department, in rhetoric and professional writing, but also um, because this is such an interdisciplinary world, um, linguistics, um, and, uh, and now I understand there is a new collaboration with design, so there is a degree, a master's degree in design and, uh, and, and writing, because another really important point is that our joint view of plain language and technical writing has always been not just language, but visual that information design is as critical a part of plain language and technical writing as the writing part has been. And again, I think that really separates the Irwin and Carnegie Mellon and Ginny and AIR view of plain language um, as carried forward by many of you here. Karen is one of the world-renowned people in the field of information design. That uh, again, it's, it's the communication that works for both the writer 
and the reader, and we have to understand the theory behind that, the theory of information design, the cognitive theory, um, linguistics basis for it, rhetorical basis for it, very different from the view of plain language held by some other people. So everybody who is, a bit, who is or has been a faculty member teaching with Irwin in this, you get to stand up and... <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I could be here all night if I talked about the hundreds of uh, MAPW students, of um, PH masters and PhD in rhetoric students, so your undergraduate students, but I have picked a very small sample because, no, we are, are only going to be here for the rest of this hour. Um, but just to show you the, um, in some ways, Irwin's legacy, and, and um, we are celebrating Irwin's life tonight, and all of these people are part of Irwin's legacy, but they're also part of the, um, uh, I, I want to also share that credit, or Irwin would be happy to share that credit um, with others of the people in this room. Um, the first person I want to start with is Irene Etzgord. Irene was in the very first class, uh, uh, MAPW class. And one of the hallmarks of the MAPW, and I don't know to what extent Irwin was the person who started this, was internships. And maybe it was because Janice had told me that back in the um, Margaret Morrison Carnegie College major in technical writing, um, there, every student had to do a capstone project with an internship, and Irwin arranged those internships for people, and in many ways, Janice said that's what started her on her technical writing career. Well, years later, the same thing was true for Irene, and she took an internship with the third group in our document design project collaboration, Siegel and Gale. She has been there ever since. She is now um, executive director for simplification. And, <laughs> that great? Uh, she and Alan have just come out with a book called Simplify, and it has been, uh, they're very good at getting themselves publicity. They're in a very high power New York Madison Avenue firm. There was a front page article in the Wall Street Journal about this book, and a front page article in the New York Times about this book, Simplify, by Alan Siegel and Irene Etzkorn. And as her example for us, Irene chose um, this before and after from a project they have been doing in redoing the notices from the IRS. And what's interesting to me is that the before, um, these are a little hard to see um, here, but the before is actually not bad when you think about plain language. The title says, we figured your tax for you. Um, you owe money to the IRS, something like that. But the after is so much better information design. This still says, read me, read me, read me. Whereas if you get a notice from the IRS that tells you you owe money, what do you want to know? How much do I owe, right? <laughs> and the next thing you want to know is, what do I need to do? That's plain language, right? And this project, that this is an example of, won the top prize in the Center for Plain Languages Clearmark Awards in 2011. And I'll talk um, at near the end because it's the new incarnation of the Communications Design Center and the Document Design Center, the Center for Plain Language, which gives out Clearmark Awards for the best plain language of the year. So again, from her MAPW background. The second person I want to talk about from MAPW is Christina Stile, who uh, works at NIH in the National uh, Institute of Child Health and Human Development. And um, I love this story because I didn't know that Christina was an MAPW, as um, Chris Newworth said, I should have recognized from just from being with, but Christina and I, have, this Christina and I have worked together. Um, and I didn't know about it until Karen Jackenberg wrote and uh, gave me a list of um, people who were MAPW graduates and Christina's name was on there. Well, Christina and I actually worked on this website called Milk Matters. And 
We did it in a user-centered design process. We got together all the people in NICHD who had to agree to what we were doing. And uh, Christina and I led the session in which we got them to state their purpose, what they wanted the website to achieve. Um, we got them to talk about the audience. And today, for websites in particular, we actually create personas. You've talked about that in your, OK, so we created personas for this uh, site, which is primarily aimed at the parents of children between the ages of 9 and 18. So tweens is the new word for uh, 9 to 12 year olds. Um, so parents, uh, the purpose is get them to get their kids to drink milk beyond babyhood, to say, no, you don't stop drinking milk when you outgrow the bottle. Um, and look at how conversational it is. Everything on this site is questions and answers, not buried in an FAQ someplace, but actually as the content of the thing. This site won um, a prize in plain language, won a plain language award from the, National from the National Institutes of Health, which actually has an active annual plain language award program. But when Christina wrote to me and I said, I want to use Milk Matters because we worked on it together, she said, OK, that's fine, but I want to tell you another story because it has an Irwin story in it. And that is that after we worked together on, on this, and I'm a consultant, so I only got to work on a project, and I didn't get to work on all of Christina's projects. She um, did a paper booklet called Adventures in Parenting. It's a guide for parents, kids of different ages, uh, for different behavior, different problems, different situations. That booklet won the first ever prize in plain language from the secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services. That's the level higher than NIH, the National Institute of Health. And um, as you can imagine, Christina was very excited about that. So she, she sent word to a lot of her friends that they had won that prize. And she said in an email to me that one of her friends is a PhD student here. And I don't know if that person is in the room or not, or maybe has already finished um, the PhD. Um, in rhetoric, and that this friend mentioned in an English department meeting that Christina had just won this major award with her book about adventures in parenting, and that Irwin then, the very next day, sent Christina an email of congratulations and asking for some more details about the award. And so Christina wrote back to Irwin and gave him some details about the the story, and said, I couldn't have done it without you. And Irwin promptly wrote back to Christina and said, well, in 20 years of MAPW students and hundreds of MAPW students, no one else has ever won that award before, so you should take credit for it. <laughs> but he said, I'm happy to bask in your reflected prominence. <laughs> and Christina said, that was thrilling to her, and I agree. It was um, Irwin's generosity, um, his kindness uh, to uh, Christina, and a uh, real, to me, part of Irwin's always willingness to share. Let's turn to the PhD in rhetoric and look at a few people, because the PhD in rhetoric from Carnegie Mellon has had tremendous influence in the commercial world, in the academic world, in the consulting world. So I think we have to start with um, the late Mary Dielli, who was one, must have been one of the first PhDs from there, because Mary went from her PhD at Carnegie Mellon to Microsoft, and Mary started usability at Microsoft. Right? That's right. Um, and uh, this is by a much later person. Mary, unfortunately, passed away very young. Um, but um, you cannot build a useful product or website without usability testing. They learned it from Mary, who learned it from CMU. Right? That Karen said, it's part of the process here. Um, Microsoft has hundreds of usability specialists today. 
They have usability studios and labs all over Redmond and all around the world. Um, Mary stole Marshall McClintock from me, um, PhD in philosophy actually, who'd been working with me at AIR, learned usability from me at AIR, Mary stole him. Uh, Mary stole Ken Dye, who had been a student here, then came to work for me uh, at AIR, um, and then went out to Microsoft and retired very young, because at Microsoft you can become quite wealthy um, very quickly. Uh, a, um, CMU, um, AR, the document design concept, um, has had a tremendous influence, which is probably not as well known, not only in Microsoft, but for example, um, Tom and Kate Gamal were MAPW students um, in the 80s and uh, went out to Apple in the very early Apple days. Um, had tremendous, again, influence in Apple very early. Um, they didn't stay because they decided that they really were Midwesterners, not Californians, and went back to um, Milwaukee where they still run a very successful consulting firm in plain language and usability. Um, P, uh, the PhD in rhetoric, of course, the whole point is to produce other academics, and um, I think, to me, um, the canonical example of that, Pat Sullivan, who a professor at Purdue. Um, I still use Pat's dissertation in my workshops. Um, Pat did, I, I have to remember, those of you who are digital natives, have to remember that in 19, the early 1980s, the computer was a new thing, and we didn't know how com people used computers and computer documentation. And Pat did her um, doctoral dissertation on a study of people using a, soft using a software and the manual for it. And what she learned in this study was no one went to the manual, no one read the manual first. People only went to the manual when they had a problem. They didn't read more than two sentences at a time because what they wanted to do was get back to what they were doing. No one read the entire introduction even though it was only three paragraphs long. Right? Now, to you folks, that's obvious. But it wasn't obvious when she, right, in the 1980s, was it? So uh, um, this wonderful, seminal article in the world of plain language and technical communication. And then for my exemplar in the consulting world, I think the only person, uh, the obvious person for this is Karen Shriver, who is um, here, who um, will come up again and again in this talk because I'm going to get to the Communications Design Center in a few, in a few minutes. Um, but Karen uh, now um, consults through her firm, uh, Karen Shriver Associates uh, Incorporated. Karen was in the second class of the PhD in rhetoric, and um, her dissertation won the National Council of Teachers of English Award for Best Dissertation of the Year. So the programs that were started out of what Irwin and Dick Young and Dick Hayes did produced a number of award-winning um, theses and uh, uh, people gone on to win awards and other things. The example that Karen shared with me for this is actually a very visual example. This is the before of installing a piece of hardware and it's really very difficult to figure out what to do here. Um, here is the after and I'm sorry this probably isn't as bright as uh, it, it should be but so much simpler and to make the point that visual is as important as we call it plain language. We call it technical writing, and yet it isn't only language. It isn't only writing, at least to those of us who come out of this cognitive rhetoric linguistics theory based vision of what plain language and technical communication is. And of course, um, Karen pulled an awful lot of history, of case studies, of guidelines. Um, of research um, into her um, book, 1997, right? Dynamics and Document Design. I'm sure a lot of you have read it. If you haven't, you really need to go and get it and read it. It really is um, classic in the field. 
And I do want to go back to the BA in um, professional writing because that has also produced uh, people who have gone out and influenced the world. For example, Saul Carliner, um, who was an undergraduate here and apparently did an incredibly interdisciplinary undergraduate in mixing technical writing and professional writing with many other things. Saul went on to do a master's in technical writing at Minneapolis and a doctorate in instructional design at Georgia State and is now a professor at Concordia in Montreal. And uh, Saul shared a number of articles. He's very prolific. In fact, Saul Carliner, this person, and Carol Barnum um, in Atlanta were the editors of the volume that Karen talked about, my article on Understanding Readers, is the first article, the first chapter in that book that Saul and Carol um, uh, edited. And Saul shared a, a couple of articles with me for this, but I picked this one because it is so Carnegie Mellon to me. A three-part framework for information design, physical, cognitive, and effective. I mean, right, this is what he learned at Carnegie Mellon. This is part of Irwin's legacy. Um, Saul also is a connection to the professional society. Um, when Irwin was starting the technical communication major at Margaret Morrison was just the same time that a number of very small different professional groups of technical writers, technical editors, again almost all male, um, joined together and formed the Society for Technical Communication which is more than 50 years old now. And Saul is a past president of the Society for Technical Communication. And in fact, another MAPW graduate who is in the room today is the current president of the Society for Technical Communication. Alan Hauser, yes, and often. <laughs> so, um, what Irwin was part of starting, and not entirely Irwin, lots of other people here, but what CMU started and still does today in those graduate programs, tremendous influence. They were part of the document design project. The other part was the research component. And again, um, I and others at the, in the AIR team brought our background in linguistics. AAR is also the place where a lot of instructional systems design happened, but CMU was the place where the cognitive theory and the rhetorical theory were happening. As I said, Dick Hayes and Linda Flower were doing research at the time. The document design project produced three books, 18 technical reports, and uh, lots and lots of other things. Um, one of the most important studies, I still use this in my workshops. Um, Linda, Nick, and Heidi Schwartz must have been a student at the, at the time. Um, Dick and Linda were doing um, studies using the Think Aloud protocol, which is also a Carnegie Mellon, um, right? Erickson and Simon at, at Carnegie Mellon, although I have to say what we do in Think Aloud in our usability testing today isn't really and Erickson and Simon think aloud um, for the most part, but it, it, it derives, it does derive from that. And Dick and Linda were doing think aloud studies at the time of people writing and people reading, but I'm talking about at the moment, um, the kind of research where they were primarily working with students. And I think this is the way it happened, but you can correct me, that I said to them, um, I'd love it for if you used that technique, but picked an actual document, a government document, since we're here to make government documents better, and um, had as the participants in the study the real users of that document, not students. So they picked a government regulation and had as the participants in the study the folks in the Pittsburgh office of that government agency, that is people who have to interpret this regulation to people outside, and the people outside who had to comply with it. And they took think aloud protocols of the people reading and thinking through um, what they were reading. And then they analyzed those protocols. And what they discovered was that 
in trying to understand it, people didn't do readability formula kinds of things. That is, they didn't shorten the sentences. They didn't substitute a word here and there. They retold the information in stories. They turned these, the, the example, and the example I use in my workshops is that one of the pieces of that, that it, it's, a, it's a sentence this long, it has no people in it, it's all in the passive, in the nouns, and in order to understand it, people will say, oh, okay, that means that if someone does this, I'm supposed to do that. They turned them into active action scenarios. They called it the scenario principle. It's the heart of what plain language is really all about. Now again, this is really based in um, understanding this is based not only in the linguistics research that I know about, knew about at the time, um, actives are easier, um, and according to some linguistics theories, um, if you read a passive sentence in order to understand it, you turn it into an active sentence. No wonder people have so much trouble with government documents or passive documents. Look at the effort it takes. And I think in that study, they were wrong most of the time in their interpretations. So you're, if you don't write clearly, people will misunderstand. But um, the research that Dick and Linda were doing at the time also was really trying to understand this from a deep theoretical cognitive base. So this is the model um, that they published in 1980 in the Greg and Steinberg book. Now I know it's been updated and revised over the decades since then, but it really started there. So if we move then in our last little bit of time together here um, to bring plain language, Irwin's life, technical writing up until today, um, out of the document design project, both Carnegie Mellon and AIR started centers that went beyond the government project that was our original funding. We called it AIR, we called our center the Document Design Center. At Carnegie Mellon, you called it the Communications Design Center. So this is from uh, the Document Design Center at AIR. We actually published a newsletter called Simply Stated, um, that it um, grew to have 18,000 people who got this newsletter about 10 times a year for about 10 years. And I still meet people who say, oh, Ginny Reddish, you're Simply Stated. I wish you were still publishing that. Or I have a whole collection of that. So it was uh, really wonderful. And um, at the Communications Design Center, started right by um, Dick Young, right, and Erwin Steinberg, and Dick Hayes, and uh, possibly other, other people. And then um, Tom Duffy was here for a while running it, and then Karen Shriver um, was a major part of it um, from about 1979 to about 1996 or so. 1990, 1990, and uh, posthumously uh, won the Diana Award from the um, uh, Society for the um, uh, Design of Communication. That's an organization that kept the same initials and changed its name over time. So from the ACM Society for the Design of Communication. Um, but the Communications Design Center kept the technical um, reports uh, series uh, running, and here is Irwin and Pete Jones in a technical report describing the new graduate program. And one of the things that Karen Shriver did in the Communications Design Center was to make it very international, to broaden. It isn't just plain English, it's plain language, it's clear communication, it's technical writing globally. And so here is Irwin in uh, Karen, uh, somewhere in the 1980s, right, um, with a Japanese visitor. Right? Um, now, what happened then, uh, so the document design project ran for about three years in the late 70s, early 80s, and just as the money was running out, the time was running out for the document design a project, even though we had started the two centers, the world changed. 
and it changed in two ways. In the government, Ronald Reagan became president, and one of his first acts of office was to rescind all of Carter's executive orders on plain language because the Reagan administration didn't believe in regulations. They didn't want them to be clear. They didn't want them to exist. <laughs> and they tried to do away with the Department of Education, which had funded the document design project. So the government was no longer interested, at least at that moment, in plain language. Well, the saving grace for us was that that was exactly the time that the personal computer emerged. And um, I'm not quite sure how it started in the Communications Design Center, but at AIR, um, our connection to that started because the vice president of IBM called me up and said, we're about to put a personal computer on the desk of every executive in America, and we have no idea how to talk to people like that. We only know how to talk to the systems people in the back room. So will you come help us talk to people like that? Well, again, you folks, born much later than that, probably have never seen a manual in which the instruction looked like this. Issuance of a top command results in a line zero condition. Right? This is what, but this is what manuals looked like at the time. Nouns, right? empty sentences, no people. And this is what, out of Irwin's legacy in starting <laughs> technical <laughs> communication, out of all that we had done in the document design project, out of our understanding of plain language, we, I, I really take some credit, I give Irwin and you folks credit, in the 1980s, we changed the world. <laughs> we changed the world of computer documentation from stuff like that to what I think of as the main contribution of technical communicators is to think of everything we write as a conversation. Right? It's an asynchronous conversation that is not in the same time, but it's still a conversation. And at the same time, because of the emergence of the personal computer, the whole field of technical communication did a flip-flop. So instead of being primarily engineers writing engineering stuff, it became a much more gender-mixed world of many, many women, um, more women than guys in the program here, um, writing computer document, computer manuals, online help, conversational writing. And this kind of, in some ways, culminated in 1991 in the book that Irwin um, uh, edited, Plain Language, Principles, and Practice. And this was a wonderful book in that it really shows Irwin's um, broad reach and broad um, wanting to draw everybody in because there are chapters from people from the Document Design Project, the Communications Design Center. Karen has a, a chapter um, in, in, that, in that book. There were papers by students. He invited students to and former students to be part of this book. But I also have to tell you my personal story related to this book because to me it is, again, Irwin and Irwin's kindness. When he was putting together this collection, Irwin wrote to me, I was then head of the Document Design Center at AIR, and said, there is a chapter going into this book which is going to be very negative about the whole idea of guidelines and about your book, The Guidelines for Document Designers. So I have to back up a minute. One of the three books that came out of the Document Design Project, done primarily by the folks at AIR, was called Guidelines for Document Designers. It's 25 guidelines with the research basis behind the guidelines, examples of the guidelines, and qualifications for, um, because again, we don't believe that they are prescriptions, so when they might be appropriate and when not. Uh, I will tell you that this book is still in demand. I still get emails from people saying, um, my copy is falling apart. Uh, are there new copies? I just, I, I have actually reprinted this myself um, because people really want a copy. And the uh, um, 
American Medical Writers Association is actually considering reprinting this book, even though it is 30 years old. Um, but as Irwin wrote to me and said, there's going to be a chapter saying that's not a good thing to have. But I will give you space to write a chapter for yourself about this. And so I had a colleague at the Document Design Center go out and do a little empirical study so we would gather some empirical data to, um, we hope, uh, we hoped at the time, support our belief that um, guidelines are not prescriptions and people don't take them as prescriptions. And um, indeed, that is what happened out of the 30 people that were involved in this. The research showed that expert writers have internalized these guidelines. They don't need the book, but they, when you, they think about it, realize that they are in fact applying guidelines from their heads. And they know they're not rules. They know that you have to think about them. Um, and n novice writers, or the main audience for this book, who were subject matter specialists who write, but who aren't trained as writers, were very glad to have the guidelines because they didn't have them internalized. Guidelines aren't rules. Um, they're advice. And they can conflict. And the folks who were writing the chapter in, um, for this book, saying that the guidelines were bad, had chosen as their way of um, proving their point, which I don't think proved their point, and I'll say that in a minute, um, by gathering examples of writing of published documents that good writers had supposedly been involved in and by showing that the final version of those documents didn't always follow the guidelines. Well, what we also found in our little empirical study, which shouldn't surprise any of you who've been out in the working world, the final version of any document is always a compromise and very often does not reflect what the plain language writer would have done if he or she had controlled entirely the final product. So the fact that there were sentences in these documents that did not abide by every one of the guidelines in Guidelines for Document Designers, I don't think in any way proves that the guidelines are useless. And so, uh, but again, to me, the really important point is that Irwin gave us the opportunity to write a chapter and to do this little study. And so let me take us very quickly, because we're almost out of time and I want to leave some time for people to have questions, um, to the later years of Irwin's wonderful long life and um, the life of plain language. Uh, plain language came back again in the government under um, President Clinton. And uh, Vice President Gore was charged with a project called Reinventing Government. And one of the aspects of reinventing government was, again, to government should be able to talk to ordinary people. And so there was a plain language task force headed by a woman named Annetta Cheek, who was at that time in the federal government. And this task force is the origin of the website plainlanguage.gov. Well, Annetta very much wanted there to be, the, play, the Document Design Center was gone by then, the Communications Design Center was gone by then, I had left AIR. Susan Kleiman, who uh, had taken over the Document Design Center and renamed it the Information Design Center, um, also uh, was gone. AIR moved into a very different place and um, they had kind of, I guess, lived their, lived their lives. Um, so there was no center of plain language anymore. And Annetta really wanted to have such a center. Um, tried very hard to get um, me to run it, to get Karen to run it, to get Susan to run it. Um, but we'd, we had done that. We'd been there um, all already. And uh, so uh, Annetta retired from the federal government to run and create the Center for Plain Language. And um, Karen Shriver's been on the board. I've been on the board. Irene Etzkorn, 
whom you uh, met uh, several slides ago, has been on the board of the Center for Plain Language. And the Center for Plain Language gives out um, uh, awards uh, for the best plain language of the year, Clearmark Awards, and also gives out Wondermark Awards for the worst <laughs> language, as in we wonder what they meant by that. Uh, and um, somewhat to my um, sorrow, um, tonight is in fact um, the banquet and the annual giving out of awards, and Karen and I are here, and I'm very pleased to be, to be here celebrating Irwin's life, and we will find out when we get back who won the awards this, this year. The crowning achievement of the Center for Plain Language is having been um, the advocates who really helped to pass the Plain Writing Act of 2010, introduced by Representative Bruce Bailey of, uh, Braley of Iowa and Senator Akaka of Hawaii. It was passed, uh, that was a pass of Congress passed, the Plain Writing Act, and President Obama signed it. And it is fairly vague as a, 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 a law. That is, it does not give guidelines for how to do plain language in the law. It gave the requirement of developing those guidelines to the Office of Management and Budget. And the Office of Management and Budget passed on that requirement for what would be the federal guidelines for how to do plain language to the folks at plainlanguage.gov. Although Annette had retired, um, there still is a federal plain group. And in fact, it now is composed of the plain, the people in charge of plain language. Every government agency has to have a person assigned to be in charge of plain language. That's part of the law. And those people now form the federal group plain. The federal plain language guidelines, I will be happy to report to you, are really based on the work of Erwin Steinberg, everybody here at Carnegie Mellon, myself, and AIR. The definition of plain language in the federal guidelines of the United States are the goal of plain language for users to be able to find what they need, understand what they find, and use what they find to meet their needs. Okay. This is my definition decades ago. They have taken this and adopted it. The federal plain language guidelines say the measure of plain language is a usability test and not a readability formula. Right? So this is part of Irwin's legacy and all of ours. And now, um, that's where plain language is today. Again, we have an administration that believes in transparency and plain uh, writing. I will, I will have to say that here we are still fighting the good fight. Uh, there's still plenty of people out there. There's plenty of work for you folks when you graduate. There are plenty of documents that still need to be put into plain language. Um, but our definition of plain language has actually been adopted by several other countries as well. Um, Norway, Sweden, the Scandinavian countries have plain language movements. There is an international plain language um, organization, actually two of them, Clarity, pri primarily focused on legal documents and another version of plain uh, focused on plain language. There is a new, the European Commission has a team building a new curriculum for Europe on um, plain language. Karen is part of the advisory committee for that, as am I. So again, um, from Irwin's um, starting technical writing here at CMU in 1958 um, to today. And uh, I think it's really important to have that history, and thanks to Karen Shriver, who was actually putting together this history, um, a very extensive timeline of this history. We picked the page that has Irwin's 1991 book as the first thing on that page, and Karen is writing a history to go with that, and I am um, urging her to publish it where it will get the widest reading, and it will again be part of Irwin's legacy. And so uh, I want to thank all the many people who helped me uh, put this um, talk together uh, with all of these pictures in it, and I um, thank you for sharing the celebration of Irwin's life with me. Thank you.
time for questions. I know we're all anxious to get to the reception, but uh, any questions or not? Or shall we just go, uh, Dave, shall we just go any, to reception? Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> we can always uh, ask them out there in the, uh, in the reception, too, if okay, anybody has something. Thank you very much. Thank you.